Hey everybody, it's Donovan with the Music Retail Podcast. I want to thank you for being here today and for watching today's episode. I think you're going to really, really enjoy it. You know, my goal with the Music Retail Podcast is to interview people that are interesting, that have something to give and to share that can help you build a better business. In order to make sure you receive future updates, please like and subscribe. That not only will keep you in the loop for things as they come up, but it also helps the YouTube algorithm to know that people actually like this content and will share it around. Okay, let's get to the interview. All right, so my guest today is Mike and Miriam Risco from Risco Music, and these are some of my favorite NAM folks. Uh, Mike started his music school in 1995, a uh, guitar player. He also teaches bass, keyboards, and the drums. Uh, and then Miriam joined uh, a couple of years later, teaching voice and piano. And I understand that they were in a band together before this all started. And of course, now you guys are married, but the music and the band came first. So we're going to launch into a little bit about the background of how you guys met. I want to f- hear a you know, quick summary of like how the business got started. But I definitely want to spend a lot of time talking today about your virtual music school because you guys did a session on this at a uh, Winter Name show a couple of years ago about doing video lessons. And uh, at the time, this was pre-pandemic or whatever, and I went and thought, that's a clever idea and took notes and thought, someday I'm going to pull this off. And when the pandemic hit, I pulled out that notebook and you saved my bacon. So, (laughs) And then you just recently did a really great um, session for the Believe in Music Week that Nam put put on. So we're going to talk about all that kind of stuff as well. So welcome to the Music Retailers Podcast, Mike and Mary and Risco. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Thanks for having us. Yes. So tell us the background. I want to hear, uh, like, you know, which came first, the, you know, the, the band or the relationship. Tell me the story of, of how this this industry power couple came to be. Wow. Well, well wait. Let's. So we're going to predate <laughs> everything and go back to when Mike taught me guitar lessons. I think when I was in college, he's not much older than me, but he used to teach me guitar lessons. And at, at your mom's at house? At my mom's house when I lived with my parents. That my is mother, awesome. At my mother-in-law's house. Yeah, so, um, and then what happened next? So then well, we... actually, you want to go back even slightly further? Sure, than yeah. That? The, the way that this started, um, you know, you've been singing since you were five or whatever, you know, like could talk. I've been playing guitar since I was, uh, you know, 12, 13 years old. And so I was working in a gas station in the town that I grew up in, and I would pra- I have my acoustic guitar here, my very first acoustic guitar hanging up on the wall behind us, but I would practice guitar in between pump and gas. And this guy came in, he was a regular customer, I didn't really know who he was, and one day he goes, hey kid, come here a second. And I go, what? And he, and he took out a, a, a brand new, beautiful Stratocaster with lace pickups and an amplifier, and he goes, here, I want you to borrow this. And I said, for what? Who are you? And he said, I own a music, I own a music store in Austin, and um, I see you playing on that thing. He went, why don't you try this out? So he gives me like a thousand dollar guitar, you know? This is when I'm like 16, 17 maybe. And um, my mother said, where did you get that? And I said, this guy gave it to me in the gas station. And she said, yeah, right. Uh, so anyway, he goes, I'll, I'll come back in like a month and get it. So I used to bring it to work and practice. Um, and he came back, how'd you like it? I said, that was great, thank you. And he goes, you know, I own a music store. I want you to work for me. And um, I declined. I said, if I'd be interested in teaching, if you wanted a teacher, I, but you know, I, I was going to be the next Led Zeppelin, so I wasn't really interested in <laughs> doing, you know, working retail. But uh, at the time, so uh, so a couple of years later, he found me, and he needed, you know, he didn't need a teacher at the time. But a couple of years later, his teacher that he had in the store left, and he hired me to work here in the very building that we own that we're sitting in. So I taught here at that time was when I was going to teach you guitar right, lessons. Right, and parallel to that, I was living in Austin, in New York, and I used to come to this music store all the time and look at sheet music because I loved singing and I, I loved musical theater. And that was, I was going to be like, I wanted to be on Broadway. And I used to go through all the uh, sheet music racks, which now sit where my office is, which oh, is wow. kind of like a cool story. And the other part is we later found out that this person that was a distant relative of mine that we had no idea. So it's kind of like a weird thing. It all sort of came together in this building that we're in now, which we'll we'll get to. So then you taught me at my house, but then we had another round of you coming well, then, to teach yeah, me. Yeah, so right? I taught you, I, I used to work here when this was when this other guy owned this as it was just a music store. Um, you know, and I taught lessons in literally like a closet. Like he, I, I was in like a little tiny, tiny room teaching. And uh, then when they closed at six, I would drive around town and teach people at their house. And Miriam was one of those people. 
And then short, a couple of years after that, um, the, I had a great relationship with this guy. He, he said, why don't you go open a music school? I'm not going to, I don't want to do lessons anymore. And so he sort of encouraged me to do that. So I moved right down the street and opened the beginning of Mike Risco Music. And I started um, taking lessons from you. I took a few lessons there because yeah. I was like, no, I want to play the guitar. Like I really, like I played piano, but I really wanted to learn the guitar. And yeah. so then one day um, I had a band and I needed a guitar player. And uh, I asked Mike, and what did you say? And, and, and listen, and the beginning of the music school. He had his own band. Though. The beginning of the music school was like, uh, it was like, it was rough. I had a, I mean, I was, I had, I rented it for very little money. I borrowed money to get in there. I had my friend's bedspread on the window for a curtain. I had lawn furniture uh, in the waiting room. I changed all that. I would ask people, I'd ask my customers, if the phone rings while I'm teaching, can you answer it? You know, I mean, no computer, everything in a notebook. It was, it was, it was tough. I had everything I owned in one room, and then I taught in another room in a waiting room. But I must but, have thought you were a good teacher because I took lessons, right? <laughs> yeah. I always love teaching. I, I think I have a, have a knack for that. And I just love guitar just as much as I did then. Now I'm still, you know, looking at the latest pedal and amp and string. And, you know, I just recently got a new pick that I'm really interested in. So, I, you know, it's just such a fun, awesome thing. But yeah, but Miriam came along and was like, you don't have a computer? And I was like, no. <laughs> so we, so... You had your band. I had a band. I, yes. We needed. I needed a guitar player for some. Was it the July Fourth thing? Was it uh, possibly? Yeah. We, we got this really cool gig with this band that I was in. It was at South Street Seaport for Fourth of July, nineteen ninety-seven. About seven thousand people there. And we. I needed a band to play, so we actually. He ended up doing it. We put a, a quick band together, and we did this huge gig. So that's sort of like where it all started and yeah. and continued to play after that. But that was like a really interesting opportunity to play for a lot of people. And, you know, we really connected. And, you know, then then I started working. Uh, he said, you should come teach voice at, and piano at the music school. And I was like, really? And and I, I tried it and I loved it. And I have a marketing background. Um, I worked in advertising and I worked in sales. So I started working with him and we, we built it from there. The, the two of us as teachers, and we built it up to 30 instructors. You were the and... missing piece. Oh. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Definitely. And so then when did you get married? So we got married in 2000 in our music school. <laughs> Yeah, actually, we have a picture right there. You want to show them the picture, Mike? We had, oh, that's um, so perfect. That's yeah, so, so we perfect. had a, a really big room. So what happened was initially we had oh. um, <laughs> we had uh, like one floor, and then at a certain point there was a leak in the roof, and the landlord decided because we were renting at the time, the landlord decided to put another floor on the building, and we said, you know what? If we don't rent this space we will never grow so we actually rented it and at the time when we got married the space was it was like what was it like a thousand square feet or, or yeah, more, more just of empty space so it was mm -hmm. kind of just built as a big loft and it was interesting because we lived in the, we had an apartment at the time in the building and i remember going to the guys that were building it one morning they said how do you want us to build this because we were taking on a lot you know and um, I brought, I, we built it out of Legos and I, and I, I showed them, I said, this is what I want it to look like. <laughs> and they looked at it and said, are you kidding? But they go, oh, I, I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah I get it. Uh, so, um, so, we had, so we had 80 of our closest friends come in to this wedding that we couldn't even fit a band or any live music in because the right was big enough. And we got to walk down the aisle in our own music school, which was really cool. <laughs> Okay. So, yeah, so Miriam was saying, so we got married in, in that room. So, um, the music school just, you know, the beginnings were so tricky in the beginning, you know, it was like, I, we rented space, we started moving on people on the floor of that building, there was maybe like four or five other offices and people kept moving out and we kept renting another room and then another room. And that's kind of how we built it up. We had the whole floor of that <clears throat> and um, of this building, which was probably 2,200 square feet. And like you said, the, the roof was leaking and it kept leaking. And, you know, my landlords at the time, they were saying things like, just put a bucket down there. And I'm like, we can't work like that. You know, like it's the, it's the waiting room, a lesson room. And they're like, I just don't worry about it. It was like a lot of that. And then they, they, it was a flat roof, you know, here in New York, which is a little challenging. 
And, um, and then they said, listen, we're going to build another floor on the building. We had an apartment on, in the sort of back building that was attached to the front building. And I said, you know, right. We said, if you can, if you can attach them, it'd be great. You know, we'll just like come out of this room and we'll be in the music school. And that's what we did. We had this big loft room that they built. They said, we're not going to build any rooms in there or anything. We're just going to build this gigantic 2000 square foot, you know, second floor. Um, so we rented it and for a while, you know, I was teaching up there just by myself. I was just teaching in 2000 square feet and me with my mm-hmm. little camp and I used to ride my bike around up there. I mean, it was just this gigantic space. So we, uh, then we wanted to expand more. And so we were going to build more lesson rooms, you know, and this is some of the hard part. It doesn't all just come so easy. We really, we didn't have the funds to do it. You know, we had very little money and we, um, I was getting up at like five in the morning, renting a truck from Home Depot, buying tools, buying sheetrock. I, I, I did most of it myself. I carried sheetrock up to this third floor. I built all the rooms. I laid carpet. I mean, it was like I would work from five, six in the morning to one o'clock in the afternoon and then teach lessons from like one o'clock to nine o'clock at night. And then I would do construction all night, you know, until midnight wake up in the morning and just do it all over. And I just kept doing that until it was built. And then we had our wedding there. And you even uh, taught a lesson um, the yeah. day of our wedding yeah, in we, a tuxedo. Yeah, we had, we, <laughs> we had a teacher bail on, um, uh, uh, on on that day. And I had a tuxedo on. I go, are you kidding me? Man? I'll just teach him. So like, you know, I'm teaching in a tux. People are like, what's going on? I'm like, I'm getting married in like two hours. So let's go. <laughs> <laughs> we, we didn't take any time off before the wedding. Well, for a honeymoon because we didn't right. go on one, so it was all just sandwiched in there with like our. Work and work. It was a, it was a great party though. We had you know, I remember there it was like plywood floors. We we didn't have carpet at the time, yeah. and I remember putting in lights, installing like lights, and calling my friend. Go, How do you hook up the wires in this thing? And, and we were like, "Is the floor going to hold all these people?" Yeah, <laughs> and then uh, I think I called the police like at three in the morning to ask like we were making so much noise I couldn't believe they weren't there. <laughs> <laughs> right. We called to see if they were okay. <laughs> Check on us. <laughs> That's funny. And the wedding lasted what, like twelve hours? The wedding lasted, yeah, at least twelve hours. Oh my lord! So then, in two thousand nine, you, you purchased a building. You, you purchased the building you used to work at when you worked for that other music store. Moved in in two thousand ten, yeah. and th- and that's when you also then added products. So you added a music store to the music school. And uh, and then really started kind of growing Mike Risco Music, and it's not just Mike Risco Music School. So tell me a little bit about how that purchase came to be, the purchase of the building and all that kind of stuff. You wanna? Well, you know, we were renting, we we um, you know, f- renting, leasing space is always a challenge, and having a good lease and all that kind of stuff, and it just where we were, um, we you know, it was very busy, and we were just. Um, the, our landlord was charging us, you know, a lot of money when, you know, I guess they were, they could, they were trying to, and we just, we didn't want to stay there anymore. We said, you know, for this much money, let's, let's try to buy ourselves a building. So it just so, so happened that the guy who owned the store was selling and he wanted us to buy the store and the building, but we said, no, we only want the building. Cause at the time we, I don't think we were even sure we were going to open a store. That really wasn't yeah. our background. And so finally, I think he really wanted to sell. So he sold us just the building right. and we decided, you know what? Oh, he gave you, what did he do with the, the store part of it? I well, guess. he just, uh, the store, you know, it needed some work in it and there was equipment. It was very in it dated still. in here. so. And he said, listen, just buy the building. Let's do a real estate deal and whatever's in there that you sell, you know, just pay me the money and, um, you know. Yeah do what you want with it kind of thing. And so I did that. I sold what was left in here. But wait, so so what we did was we had well, we had this place and we still had six months left of our music school lease. Oh, yeah. So Mike was coming here and working all day trying to figure out how to run a retail store. I mean, he knows about gear and equipment, but neither one of us have ever worked no, in a store before, a whole... ever. Like I've never even used a cash register. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I ran the music school, by myself while he would be here and then he would come 
down to the music school at night and we we um and help me there so it was like kind of a crazy situation and then we started um doing construction on half the building so the building's like three thousand square feet and we decided to gut the lower part of the building for the music school and just keep the music store as it's is kind of like two levels that. it's not yeah. really two floors it's just like you step right in. So that was really challenging doing that. We were exhausted. We had luckily had really good babysitters at the time. And my mom was helping us with our kids because we, we uh, you know, and so we started that whole process. And, and that was, you know, doing a construction project like that, like gutting a building, you know, and coming up with the plans and the whole idea. I mean, it's just it's exhausting. And uh, yeah, I remember one day there was a storm and the guys were working on the building and I came here um, and there was, I had just purchased a bunch of equipment and there was water coming up through part of the floor and all the new stuff that I bought in boxes was all wet. And I, I was like, I couldn't believe it. Um, and I went in the back of the building and there was about three feet of water up against the building um, from this storm and it was coming down this hill and I was like, oh my God. So this is like at 11 o'clock in the morning, I was fully dressed. I basically went underwater during the day in my clothes and there was a drain there and it was clogged and I pulled everything out of the drain and like all this water, like thousands and thousands of gallons just went down this drain. And then, um, I walked inside, you know, soaked and I'm talking to the contractors and they go, we got, we got to do a curtain drain and then it's going to be perfect. And that's what, so we kind of stopped everything we were doing and the jackhammers came out and we did a beautiful curtain, uh, not a curtain drain, French, uh, drain. Uh, French drain inside the building did that on the whole inter interior of the building and it worked amazingly well. I mean, the guys that built it were great. Um, but you know, things like that, it, it was, it was such a stressful thing yeah. to try to do that and then go, you know, Hey, Mike Risco music. You want to talk about guitar lessons? Now? <laughs> I had yeah. two spaces that we were dealing with. Yeah. And, and two spaces and going back and forth. And so for anybody doing this, you know, it's not all, there's a road to the, get. It was there. right down the street. Sure. Though. It was, it was like a block away. It was right down the work. street. And the other interesting thing about what you were saying about not knowing about retail, you know, this building, one of the, you know, interesting things was it was known as a music store for many, many years. So people would still come here and, you know, want to purchase different things. And, you know, walking into a building and unlocking the door and then having people show up and ask for, you know, 2.5 reads for their clarinet and the yeah, literature. Like, and, uh, you have yeah. and I was like, <laughs> what? You know, I mean, <laughs> like, there's, there's a lot to learn. Yeah. 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 That's one of the great things about, you know, taking over for a business or at least opening and where one used to be is you just you do have customer traffic yeah. from day one, which yeah. can be really, really, really handy. And, you know, the story you're telling about, like all the trials and tribulations and the hustle. Yeah, man, like that's I think that's something we all can relate to. And there's a lot of times you go through those difficult time periods, like having two separate locations just because you have to finish out one lease before you can move to the other and, and it's you know it's going to be six difficult months but once that's over it's going to be worth it you know that's that delayed gratification is definitely a, a big part of a business owner's life you know yes. um, that thing like hey I'm gonna I'm gonna suffer now so I can uh, 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 you know really enjoy and, and appreciate the rewards later so yeah so when we made the move, it was uh, we did it overnight, so we didn't want to have any lapse in anything. So we did the final part of the move. We moved eight pianos and all this stuff in one day, and then we uh, basically stayed up all night arranging our lesson rooms. And in the morning, we were like, "Here we are, new space." It was really crazy. You know, and it's and and those kinds of things, the trials and tribulations, like you said, you know that that stuff for everybody. I think it happens all the time. It's still happening now, not quite sure. Much. The extremes aren't like that kind of stuff, like me going underwater, you know, but. Uh, <laughs> really? You know, you do. You've been up on the roof shoveling snow. You yeah, know, like, right. But yes, no, things. no, it's true. Uh, to my point, though, is like, you know, it's um, you're never just sitting back, you know, and everything's perfect. There's always, you know, there's always things like that going on and yeah. to hats. move ahead. You know, you have to really it's, it's just like it's just part of doing business. Yeah, you got to grind it out. So. Tell me a little bit about what your roles are today, because now, now here we are in 2021. You know, it's quite a bit different than what it was back in 97 uh, or 2000 or even 2010. So what is, you know, it, back in the beginning, you guys were really active teaching a lot in your stores and, and like that was probably a, a major role. What do each of you do today in your business? So 
I think what we did pre-pandemic and post-pandemic yeah. or during pandemic is a little bit different because it's sort of, it's funny, it, it, it almost like reverted back to some of our old responsibilities because, you know, we're here in a part of New York that was hit very hard, very early on by this pandemic. Right. And so it required a lot of, and we're still going through it here pretty, you know, it's, it's still pretty different. It's not, we're not by any means up and running it. or out of it the way the way uh you know the way we wish we were so um i think that you know now we have the store we have the school and we still perform all the time we love doing that we have a very active band that does a lot of things in the in the community we do a lot of gigs and a lot of um, community events and things like that so um mike primarily i think works in the does the store stuff um I, I, I love the store, but I still don't really know how to use the cash register back to back <laughs> office, which is really true. I am working on it, but it's so complicated. Um, so, but you know, I help out in there and I'm, I'm good at selling things. I think that I can, uh, I'm really good at selling guitars, right? And keyboards. Um, but I do all the scheduling for the music school and I run all the events. We do a lot of outside events. Um, a lot of community engagement because we really believe in being a very strong partner with the community. So we do a lot of that. So I handle all that stuff and all the social media um, and teach. You know, I still teach. And also we added musical theater to our offerings about five years ago. And that's my jam. So that's been my my baby that I've been nurturing for the last five years, which we didn't stop doing during during the pandemic. And you want right. to talk about you do? Um, so I, I basically run all the retail, you know, so we have, we have retail where people come in the store physically to buy things. Um, but then we have, uh, you know, our e-commerce site, which is riscomusic.com. So I manage that whole thing and run it. So it's, uh, you know, the relationships with the, with the vendors, you know, all the ordering, all the shipping, all the, all of that stuff, you know, everything that goes into an e-commerce site um you know inventory reports the whole thing and it's it's a big deal i didn't even realize how big and how fast it was going to happen it's been pretty busy um but it's a lot of work i mean i'm here sometimes right now until one o'clock in the morning packing boxes mm -hmm. so, um so i'm doing that i'm doing some teaching you know there was a while where i wasn't really teaching it at all i always taught or we have these adult rock bands so i always was participating and teaching in those uh so we're starting that again actually you were just starting to bring people back into our building so we're sort of dabbling in um, in the bands. We're getting that going again. And uh, we just started to bring the lessons back in. And it's been going really well. You know, we have a couple of, we have about three days with in-person lessons or like a sort of like a hybrid. Yeah, right. Kind of right. Kind of lessons. So we're managing that, so. Miriam, you, you'd mentioned about some of the community events and involvement that you do. Uh, and you guys have won a lot of like local awards and other stuff. Uh, and all that stuff is so great for earned media and just local recognition and uh, establishing you as an authority, as a destination, as a place for your community to go. Tell me, like, how did that come about to, to where you started like winning these uh, local awards or getting local recognition? How did that happen? Did that just like someone just did it or was that like a, something you all worked on to earn? Um, if I can tell me how that came about. Sure. Yeah. I just want to start it for a second. Mir Miriam is really the mastermind behind all of that. But I think that um, the concept of participating in your community where you're doing business um, and giving back kind of thing, that just that concept, we always wanted to do that. And Miriam really taught me so much about that. So, you know, one of the platforms that we have is our band. And so and we love performing. So we would donate our time to all kinds of events from baseball games to fundraisers to all kinds of stuff. And we always just did that to give back. And I think I think that kind of helped us. Yeah. In fact, on so Valentine's much. Day, we're doing singing telegrams to help our local library save their Steinway grand piano. So, right. and you know, I grew up in this town and I, I like love this town. I'm, I think. I guess I'm a, what they call a lifer here. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I just always, it's just, it's like in my heart to really make sure that uh, we're always giving back and being a part of, of the community. I think that, that it's, I wouldn't have it any other way. It just feels right. You know, we're, we're always happy to do things, to work with organizations, to partner with people and collaborate. And, it's and tying just, it to the awards, I, I think that's just been recognized, you know. I think there's so many times as, as uh, business owners, 
you know, we, we look at that community involvement as like a thing, like, well, oh, we, we, we should do it. Uh, should, you know, I should buy this ad, I should do this thing and maybe I'll get some business off of it. And it's almost more of a calculation or a sense of responsibility, but it's not something that many of them embrace the way that you've described of thinking like, no, I love my community. I love my town. Like, I want to be involved. I want to give back. I want to help whatever I can do that makes this an even better place to be. I want to be a part of that. And I think really embracing that uh, mindset uh, can be, could be very transformative for your business. I mean, first of all, it will of course radically change the way your community thinks about you. You're not just a business that's there trying to sell stuff, take money or whatever, but like you're, you're there to exist and improve uh, the community. But I think it also changes something in your heart when you think about that way. You know, if you think about like, well, I wonder if I buy this ad for this yearbook, not recommending that people buy ads for yearbooks, but if I just do that, I wonder if I get business rather than just thinking about that way, what will my business get out of it? So much of it's like, well, what can I do just to serve? I think it changes your, it really changes your heart and mentality about how you think about what your business's purpose is. It's not just there to provide a living for you and employees. It's also there to improve your community. Right. I think we have all businesses have a responsibility to be part of the community. If you just unlock your doors every day and just sell stuff and leave, I, I just, it would never be enough. I just feel like it's, it, it's like, I always, and I always said this right from day one, like we have a voice, like, you know, like really a voice, like we can sing for people. And, sure. You know, we, we should use it to, to really contribute to things. And I think it's been really well received. I mean, our community is, is so loyal to us and really like during the pandemic, we've had, we had so many people come in here and say, I don't even play an instrument. I just want to buy something from you because like, we love you. And like right. literally bring tears to our eyes that, that people were saying this to us. And it was just really, really, really nice. So if it were up to me, I'd probably just volunteer all day. <laughs> I really would. <laughs> I, he has you know, to stop me sometimes because he's like, you have to work a little you bit. Know, you know, some of it though is like, for instance, in our industry, we all have this gift of making music. And, and that's, you know, that's just this like thing that's so magical. So that's really the thing that, you know, we use. And I'm saying like all of us musicians, we all have that ability to do that and it's special. So like, you know, for instance, like, um, you know, we play, have played every year for the baseball, the local kids baseball opening day. Mm -hmm. And we, you know, Saturday, you know, eight, eight o'clock in the morning, we're setting up equipment out on the field. But, you know, for me, and I'm sure for you that the it's such a pleasure. I mean, they do this parade. So there'll be like literally a thousand kids it's like the best day of the coming year. <laughs> down, you know, with the fire truck, the whole thing It's like big event for opening day of baseball and all these kids coming down and we start playing and we're playing it's out like in the movie. field and it's just we watch them come in and we know so many of these families from we've been in business 26 and from our years own kids and you, you know, know there are there are people walking their kids down who are like a guy that I taught who's now 32, yeah you know who's walking with his kids in little league and they're like hey and I'm like yeah man and we're still rocking out you know and it's that that's really the magic part and I think that you know doing that that's worth a lot um, and I think, um, you know, sometimes doing like what you said, buying a yearbook ad or, you know, the times, of course, have changed. You know, we don't advertise in paper the way that we used to, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and it is important to contribute and buy ads and things like that. But if you can get creative with it and use your your talent, your gift to kind of, you know, in this case, spread music out there. It's I just want to add something about the baseball. They were so amazing. So last year we had just bought an ad, a banner ad to put up at the park for, for the local Little League baseball and everything got shut down. And, you know, I completely forgot that there was no season that, you know, and nobody I would like we would never dream of, of like keep the money like we wanted them to keep the money and move forward. But they, they, were, they had no baseball season this year. We were so touched. All of a sudden I see these posts on social media where they're tagging all the sponsors and really promoting the businesses that had paid the previous year. And I see our name on there and I'm like, oh my gosh, they took the sponsorship from the previous year and they rolled it over. And now they're so grateful that they're promoting us. And it was just like, it was so nice to see that. And yeah. it just gave us such a good feeling that of the community working together that I just, it, it just really made it really, there's, really There's, there's also nice. so many things too, you know, be, playing, 
uh, doing that kind of event and having all these kids that we know also from the community, we're showing them like, look how much fun I'm actually having fun doing this. Like, and kids, I think, see that and they're like, I want to do that. You know, yeah. to, to me, that's what it's all about. If I can, you know, get some kids to want to pick up a guitar. But keep know. in mind, it really embarrasses our own children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That might be the best part right there. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to add something really funny about that real quick. Our booster club is doing uh, cardboard cutouts for the audience because they can't have people in the audience. And mm -hmm. I'm, this morning I went on the site. And I'm like, I'm going to buy one of Mike and me and Mike playing guitar and me singing. And I'm like, our kids will be so mad at us if they open up these games and you see cardboard cutouts of us, not the kids. Right, right, <laughs> right. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I might just I love it. <laughs> <laughs> That's so good. Oh my gosh. So uh when you when the you're taking the band up to do this, is this mostly just the two of you doing this? Or like are you getting in a drummer and a sound guy and a bass player and a keyboardist and yeah, a kazooist and we have our we have a band of our really good friends that play with us. So our pediatrician this is the best band we've ever our pediatrician had. is our bass player. We've been friends with him for many years. And our two best friends, one is the singer, the other singer, and the and one is the drummer. The drummer I've been and, playing with for like 30 years on and off. And so they, you know, they'll do whatever. They don't care. They'll volunteer their time. And we try to pay them when we can also because, you know, it is it is their time and stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to drag everybody into this volunteer thing that I'm so obsessed with. <laughs> but, right. Um, yeah, we, we do that. And then there's another guy that we play with when we do local stuff. And he just donates his time like these, these, um, these singing telegrams we're doing on Valentine's Day. He's like, just, they, he lives in town and he loves to do it. And, and they, they've just been so nice and everybody's so willing to do it. And especially if it's for a good cause, like saving the Steinway Grand Piano at the library, you know, and it's fun. We get to play. We haven't gotten really to play in so long. But yeah. Yeah. Like our best friends, like our bass player won't ever take, even when, when we're making money, he won't ever take any money. So I pay him in basses and amps. So he'll show up and I'll have a new bass for him. What's this? I say, you have to take this. You have to take something. Well, Mike, I should tell you, I mean, I don't know if you know this, but I, I also play bass oh, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I play trumpet. So if I'm ever in the area and you need me to fill in, oh, yeah. uh, cigars, yeah. Uh, yeah. bourbon, oh, steaks, God, right? those, are, those are all the things you can pay me in. So uh, <laughs> I don't need money. That's fine. So, Maybe at, Na at Nam, we'll have to jam. Yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. Love it. Love it. I love it. Uh, okay. So let's talk a little bit about... Uh, uh, virtual lessons, virtual music school and, and, and private lessons and stuff. And uh, before we get into that, like, you know, anyone listening to this right now might think like, well, I mean, you know, the lights at the end of the tunnel for this pandemic. And I don't know if it's really you know worth it at this point, if I haven't yet invested the money or taken the time to really try to improve my virtual lessons, maybe I'll just ride this thing out till it's over. And I really think that's a mistake. And, and we're going to kind of go through some of those, uh, some of the reasons why, but first, I can't remember when did you do this 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 the video session? The session at Nam about uh, doing uh, you know, less remote lessons. Was it last winter Nam in twenty twenty or was it twenty nineteen? I feel like I was there for that one because I didn't go to that. You were winter Nam, yeah. So it must have been summer Nam. It had to was it a summer Nam? Was it summer Nam? Okay. Yeah, in, on, for winter Nam, I think our session was about community uh, Facebook groups. So it must have been summer now. Summer of 2019? I think so. I'm okay. Sure. Yeah. It, it's not super relevant other than the fact that I've, I've been trying to get this straight in my head because I, like I mentioned in the beginning, I remember sitting there and thinking this this is a clever idea and uh you know really that your thing at the time was kind of about like well sometimes kids can't make it the lessons and so you can do these video lessons or sometimes you have uh, a teacher that relocates and but their students really love this teacher and so by doing video lessons you can still keep that going and I thought that's kind of a clever idea I don't need to put that into place but like maybe I would like to at some point it's kind of kind of neat so I was making all these notes and you gave some tips on like tech and kind of how, how to get it going and so I, I'm you know I'm kind of found that away in my someday maybe type project right and then we fast forward into roughly this time last year and uh, I belong to a, a, a mastermind group uh, through the folks at Wizbang and Susan Nagan one of the, the owners of Wizbang uh, retail training her brother worked for the CDC at this time last year. And so during our one of our, our meeting at this time of the year, uh, she they started talking about this 
coronavirus and the effects it's going to have on business. Now, at the time, I just thought like, that uh, sounds like bullshit to me. <laughs> like, it sounds like SARS or like any of the other stuff. Like, I don't know. I kind of poo pooed it. But then it kind of quickly, we kind of sort of quickly realizing like, oh, no, 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 this is going to be real. And then uh, I remember we were having a follow up meeting uh, it, with this mastermind group. And I had said something along the lines like, well, if I'm forced to close my stores for you know some period of time, and Susan stopped me. She's like, no, 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 Donovan. It's not if, it's when. You're going to be forced to close your stores and they're going to be closed for a while. And I remember just sitting there thinking like, what am I going to do? And almost immediately I start digging for my notebook my that I took take with me to Nam. I'm like, I, I've got to figure out this video lesson thing like right away. And historically putting into place video lessons would have been a six month or year long endeavor, right? 48 hours. We had that thing in wow. place because <laughs> we had a shutdown that was basically coming. And I mean, we just like had it so fast, but you guys gave us the playbook back then. And then you just did a, another really great session, like I mentioned earlier, for the Believe in Music Week, kind of expanding on that a little further. So one of the first things that I want to share is just something that we experienced recently. So not only did you help save our bacon, I mean, our lesson program is down quite a bit, but not what it would be without it. Uh, but we just had something kind of interesting come up the other day uh, that we had inclement weather here in Missouri. And we tend to get a lot of ice. And so one of our stores just had a habit closed the store and canceled all the lessons and uh our lesson coordinator meter is like what what are you doing like we don't need to cancel lessons we could just make them virtual for the day like you know there's no reason yeah. to cancel it and the store manager is like oh i didn't I totally <laughs> totally forgot that so for anyone thinking like well this really isn't all that necessary i'll just probably, no make the investment because for inclement weather for teacher relocation for the times when you know, the parents are like, well, I can't get home in time to pick up Johnny to bring him to his lesson. So we need to cancel this lesson. Th these are all the reasons why this needs to be a thing. What, what are, any, any other reasons stand out to you about why virtual lessons are so important? Vacations. People take their instruments with them. We have one family right now who decided their, their kids were virtual in school. They decided to drive across the country. They're still going with the lessons. They just check in when it's their lesson time and take it. Awesome. I mean, we don't even need, we used to have somebody, because we were very generous with makeup. So we really try to work with people and give people their makeup lessons. Nobody's canceling. We don't even really need somebody in that role anymore because yeah. it's just been so, so predictable as far as like people are just like, they want those lessons. And that's why when, you know, when there was a snow day here the other day and all the schools are closing, at first we put up a thing, we're not closed. And we realized like, Nobody even complains. They're so happy. I mean, they paid for lessons and the kids are sitting home all day. Why not just log on to your lesson? You know what's amazing hour? about this is just like, I don't know how many years ago, 15, 20 years ago, when people started selling retail on, you know, e-commerce, you know, that was not like, oh, let's do this because of this. This is to, the thing to stay. It's a, we it's want an, it to stay. It's an addition. We, yeah. It's an addition to your business. And if you're not doing e-commerce in your retail, you're really missing out. You know, it's like, yeah. Buckle down, do it, borrow money, do whatever you have to do to get it going, you know, and it's it's a challenge. I know lots of people that are like, I'm not going to do that. I just don't want, you know, they don't have the brain capacity to do it. I totally get it. But then in that case, maybe hire somebody to do it, you know, figure it, make money your way that you make money and give it to somebody else to put it together for you because it's just an addition to our business. You know, our thing, I'll tell you, you know, how it started, which you sound like, you know, already, but one of we we love teaching. And I write guitar instructional books. I have a whole series of books that I wrote. And I really, really enjoy that. Um, and um, so I always wanted to do, which is still like another plan of mine. I didn't tell you our new business oh. plan. No, I'm doing, I'm, I want to do like a whole, <laughs> I want to take all my book and do all, you know, guitar another. lesson video series. And you can buy, oh a, my gosh, it's a, great idea. buy a subscription <laughs> to it. And, you know, you pay your $19.99 a month. Uh, yeah. You could say we started it right here. And, yeah, 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 yeah. Breaking news. <laughs> you know, and and it's a it's a great way for passive income, but to share what you're doing, and you know, it's just another exciting project. So, so basically, I always wanted to do live video lessons, um, and it was something I've been thinking about for like ten years. You know, so uh, one of our teachers that he was a drummer in our band, a drum teacher here, great guy. He said, uh, "Listen, I'm moving. I'm, I, you know, I wish I could keep working for you guys. This has been great." And I said, "Wait, hang on a second. 
I have this idea to do live video lessons. Do you want to try this? I'm looking at different you know, software to do this. And he goes, yeah, if you can figure that out, sure. So that's when we started doing the live video lessons. We set up a room, mm -hmm. uh, his drummer, drums, you know, beautiful uh, you know, acoustic tiling around and speakers and monitors and a big flat screen on the wall, two different cameras for different camera angles. I talked to all the parents, all the adults to take lessons with him and everybody was like, let's, let's do it, let's try it. I had to really explain, you know, 20 minutes at least with each family to explain what this was because nobody yeah. had even heard of it, you know. So <clears throat> there was a couple people, like one out of every 20 people, a parent would go, would say, oh, yeah, we use that for work. Um, but everybody else needed a lot of explaining. So the teacher moved to California. We set it up. His, he still works for us. This was like four or five years ago. His students would come in here, go in the room. There he was on the screen. You know, we would we'd help them in and get them. You know, make sure that people were a little bit, know, we a little were, bit puzzled. We by were it, assisting by right. with it. Then we had another teacher, same scenario. I said, let's do another room like that. And he goes, yeah, I'm in. So um, now we have two rooms, two teachers that are virtual working. You know, uh, and then what happened after that was we started having students from other parts of the country. The first one, somebody called talk to them about lessons and I said, okay, what's your address? <clears throat> and as I'm putting their address down, they said, Colorado. And I said, Colorado, we're in New York. And they said, no, I know, we're t the virtual lessons that you guys do. And I was like, oh man, this is awesome. So we started getting phone calls from people around the country um, to do virtual lessons. So yeah. we would have a teacher pre-pandemic come here, come in, go in their room, teach their regular students that would come in and out of here. And then on their schedule, they'd have an hour and a half of virtual lessons for, you know, one kid in Florida, a kid in Colorado, you know, and it, it just opened everything up. It was, so, just, it was all foreshadowing. It was so and, weird. And, you know, and then, but, of course, all the things you just mentioned, snow days, you know, somebody can't get here, just do a virtual lesson. And, and so we started building that whole thing up. And then, of course, when the pandemic hit, you know, we just moved everybody to virtual. We, um, and in the beginning, by the way, it was a lot of work because when we would talk about it, like I said, we'd have to really train everybody. And we were doing all day, I was doing trials. So somebody would call and I would, or when we would say, listen, if there's a snow day or if you can't make it, you don't have to cancel anymore. We can just do a virtual lesson. Oh, what do you mean? Then I would, we would do it right there. I'd say, here, why don't you, I'm going to send you an email right now. Let's test it out. <clears throat> so we were doing a lot of training for everybody. We're also offering um, our current students that are virtual, if they want to come in for an in-person lesson, here and there they can. And most people are not taking us up on it. They're staying with the virtual lessons. Sure. And, you know, as, as time moves on, we're getting more and more calls for in-person um, or like, but we were finding that, um, that people really like the ones that have been doing it are really happy with it. And that's why we really think it's very important to show people, don't just tell them about it, you know, right. give them that trial so that they can see what it is. Cause a lot of times they don't really, they have to visualize it. They have to see themselves in that virtual lesson so they understand what they're going to be doing. And it's kind of fun for us too, because we, you know, all the teachers will be working virtually and we run all those from here. So we can virtually pop in and out of lessons and say yeah. hi to everybody and, you know, do the lesson with them and different things like that. And, um, yeah, it's been it's been pretty amazing, actually. So I so my point in the beginning was I think this is a thing that that we will like we did before the pandemic. We'll keep it as a feature after. Like, why not? It sure. Works. And, the, and another thing I wanted to add is a lot of people in the beginning sort of poo pooed it because it doesn't work if you don't know how to use the software and you don't know how to use your camera and you don't and have you like don't, a big personality that can kind of cut through the screen and you don't have good service you know some of the technical stuff which is all fairly simple it doesn't work that way it has to you have to know how now nowadays of course we don't even i don't even have to ask anybody have you ever done a video lesson which right. is amazing so you know the thing that we had to explain so much before is just everybody knows about it now but yeah but it works amazingly well as you know if you have the right equipment and the right personality and everything in place so when the student and the teacher have everything in place properly it it's works perfect. perfectly yeah. works great you know it used but pre-pandemic there was a lot of heavy lifting in the beginning to get people yeah. to know what zoom is to make sure they had the correct equipment to, to get on uh to explain to them like you know how it all works and you know to get to test the stuff shoot all all that all the heavy lifting's done for you now everyone knows zoom everyone knows how to do remote stuff like that part's uh, not that challenging but mike you said something uh that's really interesting that i don't know that i really uh, internalized yet and that's 
the comment you made twice about this is here to stay. This virtualization of lessons is not something that's going to come and go, just like e-commerce is here to stay. And I got to tell you, I didn't, I, did, I just, it hadn't, it hadn't clicked for me yet until you said that. And you're completely right. And I wish I could tell you that I'm the type of like visionary business person that always has the whole landscape figured out and never misses an opportunity. <laughs> but the reason why I do this podcast is because I'm not. And uh, yeah, I am one of those people that sometimes can get stuck. Like, well, I'm going to do it the way I want to do it. Like, I don't want to sell guitars to someone that I can't see. Like, I want to do it face to face. I want to see the look on their face when they get the guitar. Well, the business has changed. Like, you know, that's not enough anymore because there's customers that want to buy guitars without leaving their home. Well, I don't want to teach lessons to someone that's over the internet and they're not there and I can't like actually be there with them. I can't like help them with posture so much or how to hold it properly or any of those things. And the experience isn't quite the same. Well, it doesn't matter. Like there are customers that will need or want that convenience of being able to take that lesson without having to leave their home. Some of them may not be able to, to leave their home or they may be able to take that lesson if they're traveling or anywhere they're at. And it's for so many times, you know, I've, I've, I've said like, well, you know, Amazon isn't doing lessons or repairs. So that's an area that we can grow and really be successful in. But if you're not careful, I mean, there are people now already doing virtual lessons and that are growing it. I'm a member of a virtual lesson website, Scott's Base Lessons, uh, you know, and, and they do a great job with this kind of stuff. So, yeah, anyone who's thinking that uh, you don't need to virtualize your lesson program or get your lesson program online because this is temporary and going away, you are getting ready to make a big mistake because this is here to stay. It's only going to get bigger. Well, you know what? The, the smartest people are the people that are willing to learn and are open-minded, just like you, like what you're saying is that, you know, you thought this and now you heard this and now you're open to changing. And it's, you know, and I think that's so important. Like I said before, if you can't build your online yourself, pay somebody to do it. You know, that that's that's how you grow as a business. Yeah. And, and you learn and you expand. You know, you don't have to do it, but just like I said, selling online, you know, why not? The, the people, we sell stuff to people. I love sitting with a person. I love the energy. I love, I love showing somebody a guitar and telling them all about it and all of that stuff. But there are, every day, people buy guitars from us. I don't talk to them. I don't get an email from them. I get nothing. They just, they look at a picture and it's all digital and we came up in their thing and they click on it and they bought it. But, you know, as far as us all doing business, why not do that? That's what that person wants. So, yeah, you know, it's you, I, you almost I have, have to be able to to now adapt your services for a much larger audience. So, like, I think our kind of our take on it is, yeah, I'm sure we'll go back to having things the way they were with the addition of this virtual music school and right. of this virtual way right. of selling. And I just I feel like you can sit on a Zoom call with somebody and show them equipment if you have that passion in you and you're it's going to it's going to show through the screen right. also well, not just well, in look person. what we're doing right now. You know, we wouldn't be doing this 30 years ago. We would say, oh, my God, we, we have to drive or fly to go see you right down. You yeah, know, yeah, which would be nicer. That would be fun and everything, you know, but it probably wouldn't happen. Let's, so let's, let's, <laughs> I mean, this is amazing that we can. Yeah. Do. Yeah. Well, and the other thing, too, uh, you know, that I mean, so I've, I've already had two kind of eye opening moments that this is here to stay. And then I got to be honest, too, like, I, I guess this is my this is my cathartic experience here. Uh, I've been one of those people that's you know begrudgingly involved in community involvement. Um, there's some things that I, I'm personally very interested in. I happily support that. But the rest of it, I kind of just do it because like sense of obligation, or whatever. And um, now. That's just me. Some of our stores are better at it because the people that actually run the stores, uh, we've got a couple of stores where like they're just very involved in, and they enjoy the community events. But not all my stores are that way. And listening to you all talk about that has really kind of inspired me to think, no, I need to embrace that. And, and I have a, want an awesome position to use my business to show appreciation for my community and to help improve and build my community and I should use this platform to 
to help and to do that with. So you guys have certainly inspired me for that. So let's talk about uh, about some of the nuts and bolts of the virtual lesson program. So uh, tell me a little bit about you know now that you've kind of done this for a, you know a couple of years of the virtual uh, virtual stuff. Give me an idea of like how you're setting up your studios. Um, what's kind of the 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 uh, the equipment that you think someone would need to do this well? Uh, you know, it's really not that complicated. Any updated computer, I mean, you can buy a computer these days for $300, you know, I don't know. So a computer, a, a decent sized screen is nice. You know, we're using right now um, a fairly inexpensive camera that's sitting on top of our screen. Um, you can use a laptop, you can use a phone, you can use a tablet, any of that. We, uh, we happen to use this microphone here. This is a mm -hmm. Samson G-Track microphone. Uh, but there's so many. It's just a USB mic. Plug it right in. So really just your computer, a camera, and a microphone. And I think the rest of it is having good service and just knowing how to have a good camera shot. You know, I can't tell you how many people do, a, you know, try to do a lesson and they're like this. They're like, they're like this. <laughs> They're like, hey, Donovan, what's going on? And <laughs> yeah. You move your camera down and then they go like this. Then they go. We're like, oh, I just, oh, there yeah, you we're go. like, you're muted. Yo, yeah. <laughs> it, was, it was part of my act. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you totally cooked me on that one. <laughs> and uh, but, you know, that, those are the things that make it not work. But it's really so yeah. simple. Camera, microphone, computer. And, you know, the, the, oh. it's also simple. I uh, uh, again through this mastermind thing through Whizbang that I'm involved in, they brought in a guest who is a professional actor and coach and stuff like that. And he had mentioned that in doing a video uh, that you basically want like the size of your fist between the top of your head and the top of the screen. That's kind of the, and, and sometimes you have to adjust it based on maybe how far you are from it and what's below right. you or whatever, but that's roughly the ratio you're looking for. You know, you don't want something where like, you're kind of down like that, or, you know, you know, we're kind of up like that. I mean, there's so many times right. you get these zoom meetings and someone's like, I don't know, it's almost kind of comical, uh, sure. but you can set it up pretty simple. I mean, the setup I'm using right now, just to do this, I've got an iPad uh, that's on, a, a a stand like we all sell these ipad mounts that that right. go on a stand so i have a, a, a basically just a, a stand and then i have a a usb-c microphone uh on a stand that connects to the it's all one rig plugs into the ipad and that's all it's done or i'm using zoom recording to zoom yeah. and uh the that's essentially what we uh, often use in our lesson studios as well so it doesn't have to be you know a ton of money uh, yeah. but you know, you can do it right and have good quality results without spending a lot of money. I like using the iPad because the camera quality is a little bit better on right. the front camera than it is, uh, on most laptops, uh, depends, depends on the laptop. Some laptops have better cameras than others, but, um, or if you're using, you guys are using external, an external camera. So you're getting a little bit better quality then. I mean, we're, we're using a, a $60 camera. Yeah. You know, yeah, it doesn't have to be a million bucks. But I can... use my laptop a lot when I teach a lesson too. And I, I just enjoy the, that it's so portable and I can move. Like if I want to be over in one part of the building instead of the other, then yeah. I'm not sort of limited to, to a room if I don't want to be since, you know. The but... other thing that I like to do technically is, um, is I have a, another camera. And so I go like this a lot, you know, and I'll show somebody, I mean, my camera's blurry now. Hang on a second. I'll, yeah. show some, I'll show somebody music and I can, you know, point to it or sometimes I use a, a pen so I don't have to see my finger so close, you know, mm -hmm. and I'll talk like that. Um, and I, I find that to be helpful to have a, you know, you can toggle between cameras. Interesting. How are you doing well, that? Um, I have a second USB camera plugged in each Zoom account or if you're on one computer, you can use two cameras. I don't think you can use more. Gotcha. Um, there might be a way to buy more equipment and do that, but you can definitely use two. Just buy another camera, stick it in your computer. And yeah. you, you know, if, if you want to not use the mouse, I like to do a lot of keyboard commands. So it's Alt N toggles between the camera. So on some of our, in, in our piano lesson rooms, we'll have another camera over the top like this. So we have one camera view where we'll, you know, you can see our body and our hands on the piano and we can look at the person like this, you know? Yes. Um, and then we toggle and then they can see our, straight down 
uh, our hands on the piano. We did that with drum lessons originally when we first started this. I had a camera by the teacher's feet. So you could see him, you know, what he was doing with his feet. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's, uh, and you, you don't really need that. You know, if that's too complicated for some people, you can do it, but you see a lot I, of- I don't even need, I don't need that. I use, uh, actually, when, sometimes when I'm teaching, I also have one of those, like, fold out, like, roll up keyboards. Mm-hmm. And I will literally pick it up, the rubber mat one, and show it so that the kids can see where to put their hands. Sure. So that's helpful too. It's, it's really whatever works for you. And we've, we've also found that just like in person before all of this, you know, there are some people that just have a knack to teach. And, you know, when you're teaching, you're almost kind of entertaining at the same time to captivate somebody so they'll listen to what you're saying. Sure. So you can teach them the right way. And some people are really good at doing that. And those people are also typically really good at doing it through the computer. It's not, it doesn't become a, a block. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I think that's really important too. Is just to have the personality to get the job done. Yeah, and you can take it as far as you want. I mean, you can do something pretty simple, or if you want to start making it even better. I love the two camera idea, and I I've, I saw on some of your videos because uh, I went on your website last night, and was kind of looking through some, of it and saw you were doing that, and was kind of wondering how you you were doing it, and I didn't realize that you could do that when you use the computer version of of Zoom. So that's really really helpful to know if you're using like a tablet or a phone you could even use the front camera and then take your music and hold it to the other side of it and do that i mean yeah i also i'll show you i also do this so like i'll take this camera which is just you know this thing Uh uh-huh just a webcam yep and i have like a, a six foot extension cord on it so if i'm teaching somebody guitar you know i will position this you know so now they can Oh yeah. You know, they could see exactly what I'm doing. So, so just in case someone's only listening, you've got a second webcam. That's uh, you, you were show, you've been showing us two things. One, you had a second webcam that you would kind of use manually in your hand and you could hold it over like the music or the, or right. whatever you're showing and zoom in on that. But then you just were showing us another webcam view that's lower. That's really just showing like the fretboard and the picking of the guitar. So it's like a zoomed in close up version of the guitar, right. all using that se- second webcam. And then you're using just the hotkey combination on the keyboard to switch back and forth between the, the main camera that's kind of on your face and the larger sort of profile and then exactly. the zoomed in cameras. So, uh, yeah, one. genius, man. It's, and it's simple. It's not that difficult and nor is it very expensive. Uh, but really well done. What about lighting? Have you made any accommodations for lighting? I mean, right now you guys are really well lit. I don't know if there's a window in front of you yeah, or if you have a, you know, okay. the, the, that, that is really important. And, um, it just happens to be that we're in my office and there's a window behind the screen. So it, this room works great, but it, but we have our lesson room set up for zoom rooms for when teachers come in here. And so they were already set up well with good lighting anyway. And actually yeah. there's a window in each of them behind the screen anyway. So that part of it, I, we didn't have to put much thought into that because that was already, you want to make sure that your light source is in front of you and right. not behind you. If it's behind right. you, no one can see you. you've got these weird shadows and you want it to be in front. And of course, lighting now is also very, very inexpensive. Uh, and it, you, you, you might find decent results with overhead lighting, but uh, that might cast shadows or maybe not quite quite create quite the glow that you want. Uh, so some lighting in front, it's all very inexpensive. And, and, you know, honestly, people can, if you want to make the investment of this and it's a uh, nominal investment, you know, go watch some, some YouTubers and people that do a lot of this type of content on YouTube, even doing like tech reviews or whatever, see how they do their backgrounds and how they're setting that up. They're doing that all very intentionally uh, with lighting and other controls to make it look inviting and professional. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of money to stage it, stage your background a little bit where, you know, you look, you look like you're a professional. Uh, so it's not that difficult to do. So uh, any tips for uh, early on this, it was, a, you know, the lag was a huge issue. Um, have you, uh, and it seems like the technology and the applications have improved as long as if you have uh, decent internet um, connectivity, but any tips for reducing or improving lag? You know, I don't really know about that. I, so far the uh, giving a lesson hasn't been any kind of issue. And I I found that if you play quieter, you know, if you're not playing so hard, you can kind of hear each other and kind of play a little bit together, but it doesn't, you know, doing like a band rehearsal over Zoom right now, as far as I know, it doesn't really work. But 
I haven't had any issue with lag because I'm not, um, I'm running a virtual lesson a little bit differently. Like I'm not playing and having the person solo over chord changes through Zoom. So that's, I mean, there's a couple things I think you can't do the same way. Yeah. In person, we'll, you know, we'll play music together. So I think at the moment, that may be a little bit of something that's missing, but... Um, but there's workarounds. I think that even for yeah. teaching voice, like if I'm accompanying somebody on the piano, I can't play through the whole song, but you can sort of play chords and they sort of follow along. Uh, so I, I think we've kind of figured out a way to make it work. It's not yeah. ideal, but maybe that will change over time. I also think that, you know, there's there are companies out there, there's software, it's not perfect yet, but people are working on ways of doing this where you can play in real time together and it's constantly changing just like even with zoom you know we use zoom but i'm also uh you know understand some of the other platforms out there and i think it's mm -hmm. that's another important thing to do because what if zoom crashes all of a sudden yeah like the whole program wiped out you know so i think it's important to make sure you're hip to other platforms to do you know so overnight you could just switch to you know, Microsoft, you know, meetup or whatever it is. You know? Yeah. All right, well, last night I was watching, I was rewatching your Believe in Music session. And then I also saw that Pete Gamber had a session and I've gone to Pete stuff kind of for years and, and um, uh, you know, uh, early on, especially like he's a very fun and interesting, uh, entertaining guy for sure. But he did a session on doing virtual uh, ensembles. I just watched and that one also. It was exceptionally good, and, and yeah. I don't want to like take his stuff because you know, but uh, we will share it anyway. Uh, is one of his big things that he found really helpful was to make backing tracks. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when you send the student the backing track, the student has the backing track that gives them something to play to and to sync to, it makes their practice at home more fun, but then it also <laughs> makes it easier when you're doing this, the lessons together because you can start the track and then they're playing along to that. It's so much, so much easier because the microphones can be difficult uh, sometimes transmitting it, but if they're sharing it, you're listening, it's, it can be, it gives them something to play along to and solo over, or do whatever, which I thought was really smart. Yeah, that was so, a great session. Yeah, it really, yeah, gosh, and the, the, your episode's going to air after the Believe in Music content's taken down, which is which is really too bad, because I'd want to implore people to go to go listen. Maybe I'll just post it to the Facebook page or whatever to get people to go listen before they can. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the, so we, we've talked about the technology, let's talk about the platform. So uh, Miriam, you had recommended that folks uh, on their website create a virtual lesson page on their website, kind of talking about like, this whole option about how people can do it. Talk, talk to me a little bit about the kind of content you have on there and why you feel like that's so important. So I think we kind of just recreated our whole business in a virtual setting on the website. So, cause when people call, the first question I ask them is I say, are you interested in in-person or virtual? Because people pretty much like, they know what they want when they're calling. So we wanna be able to help both types of customers. Um, so the virtual, Web, the, the virtual part of our website covers like the music lessons, um, the different other programs that we were able to recreate virtually. Like we've been doing a lot with musical theater virtually. Mm -hmm. we, we, we found a lot of what they call Zoomsicles and we've been doing those. Um, and it's funny too, because as we move forward, like I was saying, a lot of things are becoming more hybrid. So like these musicals, we're able to do some in person, some virtual. Nobody knows if we'll be able to actually be in person for the show yet. So it gives us a lot of options. So you want to really just leave yourself a lot of options. But mm -hmm. in doing so, I almost feel like we've made a lot more work for ourselves in a good way because we've sort of doubled our ability to do business. We're able to do it in so many different ways now that we've diversified to the point where we can help so many different kinds of customers. And I think that's why it's really important to make sure that you have really good pages on your site that that mirror what you do in, in real life or pre-pandemic. Yeah, yeah, I think that's so smart. I love the, uh, gosh, man, I'm getting so much out of this. I'm so glad I'm recording this. Uh, but uh, I love how you're saying when someone calls to sign up for lessons, you're asking in, in person or virtual. like. Because even if some there be maybe some people that don't realize you offer 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 virtual, and even if they want to do in person, it makes them aware that virtual is an option. 
Right. Uh, and, how and smart virtual, is that? Virtual is the option or and you can come in sometimes for an in-person. So people yeah. love that flexibility too. Yeah, I love that. That's so smart. So you're using Zoom to kind of do this, uh, do the tech. And you guys are essentially, if, if I understand this correctly, you are emailing your students every week with what their Zoom link is going to be. It's not always the same link or whatever. It's, it's going to be different. Talk to me a little bit about just sort of the nuts and bolts of like, what's the, what platform or how are you managing the schedules? How are you managing that, that communication? Are you like, is there someone that's kind of acting as like the uh, administrator during these lessons times uh, kind of tell me how all that's working well so our son also works for us oh, now yeah. too because we don't have many people working in-house so the majority of our staff is remote so he sort of took on the role of a scheduling coordinator and he manages he sends out the links every night um, and then he will sort of he, he kind of manages the virtual hallway during the course of the day and making sure that people are getting in and out or people will text us and, and let us know, oh, I, I can't get into my lesson or, or I lost my link or something like that. So he kind of manages all that stuff or we step in if we have to. We're kind of wearing a lot of hats right now because of the fact that we don't really have too many people in house, just the few teachers that we're bringing in, but we're trying to start to bring more people back into the building at which time I think we will have somebody back in that role full time who is sort of the old school scheduling coordinator who's coordinator who's now the new school scheduling coordinator who can sort of juggle both getting people into their lessons through the real hallway and the virtual hallway. Gotcha. So the night before you're emailing them the Zoom link for their for their particular meeting. Right. Uh, and, and at that point they can log in and, and, and do their meeting and that changes every week. It changes every week. We do it, and it's nice because it gives us the opportunity to communicate with them regularly. Um, we're doing a lot of things though within our music school community to keep people connected to our music school. So we do a monthly recital, which we've been doing on Zoom, which we were doing in person before, and we anticipate doing a hybrid one in the future. Um, we may even try to do a small one in person, you know, with no singing, of course, <laughs> but mm -hmm. with like piano playing and people sitting six feet apart. Like we're just experimenting with different things, and it's amazing. To to me all the doors that have opened because of this i mean we did a valentine recital the other day and we our theme was valentine and we said in, invite your your family members who you would like to dedicate a song to and all these kids logged on with their grandparents and the From grandparents all over, the country. Were all over and it was so cute and they were yeah. so happy to be there and you know so and i was saying to them i said it's so funny i remember doing piano recitals in my piano teacher's living room back in the day and sitting like really tight with people on the floor and uh, getting up and playing the piano. And it's so different, but so similar. Yes. And also uh, the, the, the communicating with the links is, is really interesting because we're sending, you know, every day these links out for the next day. But, you know, if you if you take the time to do it, um, you know, you can communicate with everybody like, hey, we have a recital coming up. We have this going on. And we send you know, big mass emails too, where going? they get yeah. all the information. But we really try, we check in with them constantly. How are the lessons going? Do you need anything? Do you need a book? Because they, we don't see them the way we used to see them. Mm -hmm. But we want to kind of create the feeling of like, you're still here, you know? Yeah. Well, and, you, and you're also doing like a, a newsletter for them, uh, you know, where you're kind of staying in touch with them. And, and that's more of the, Sorry. the, Sorry. the you're fine. That's more of sort of the, the big group communication, but um... <laughs> sometimes it does that, and we have the privacy setting on. But it that's our that's our next thing to get a whole new phone system. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's so, uh, but in addition to the you know the reminder emails and stuff like that, but you guys are also doing like a, a, a monthly newsletter and communicating to student your students and and you know I, that's an area again I think that we could get better. We we tend to we just someone gets in our lesson system and they're in it. They're taking lessons with their teachers and. You know, we're we're emailing them if there's an issue or something like that, but we don't we're not putting together newsletters and mm -hmm. content to kind of create this community and cohesiveness of all of our students. I think that's an area we can certainly improve in. Yeah, we do. Um, so we, we send out monthly newsletters, but now in addition to, to emailing it out, we mail it out also. And then we do weekly emails to our whole email database, but we also do very targeted ones to our students, just making sure that they have all the information they need all the time, best practices for logging in, all that kind of a thing. And then we also, everything we do, we try to make it have sort of like an interactive aspect to it. So we just sent out 
Valentine's Day cards with um, a little thing in it that we're raffling off. We, we put our, all our students into a big drawing for a huge thing of chocolate and we're going to pull it on Valentine's Day on social media. So we try to kind of like keep everything rolling in many different formats so we can communicate really well with them. That's so smart. Yeah, that's so smart. Well, and it, you know, you mentioned that you had uh, best practices and, and you guys do also provide best practices for both your instructors and the students so that everyone's kind of prepared and ready to do this. Um, so I love the interactivity and the giveaway and stuff like that for your students. That's so smart. What other content tends to be like in these newsletters? Um, so I feel like it's so funny, but I always, I, I love creating content. I feel like there's not enough hours in the day for all the content that we've been able to create. Like everything to me, I see it in terms of social media content. I'm like, that guitar would make a great picture. And I'll even do stuff like it. And I love collaborating with people on content. So just, just things like that. Like we even like, take uh, things that, you know, the other day, uh, for instance, I, I came into work, somebody was outside waiting for me. Right when I opened the door, a bird flew in with me. And I said, I cannot believe that just happened. He immediately you know? sends me the picture and of the so, bird sitting on an Alvarez guitar. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's great content. <laughs> yeah, so so anyway, I'm following this bird around trying to get him, you know, back out the door. And so he's, you know, it's like 45 minutes of my first walking into the seal of this bird. That. And I'm here by myself. So anyway, he landed on an Alvarez guitar. I took a picture of it. I sent it to Miriam because I knew she'd do something with it, right? And then the next thing you know, it's on social media and there's, you know, a hundred comments about, you oh, know, it looks like the Woodstock, like, you know, it looks like logo. the Woodstock thing or, you know, play <laughs> yeah. the bird or, you know, it was all bird songs and it became this, you know, it was thing. nice. It was like not a promotional post, you know, it was just an interactive. Post. There's a lot of little things like that. One of our biggest posts on social media, uh, you know, and this is like a community thing, you know, I was, there was like two feet of snow one year and I was on our, we have a flat roof on this building and I was getting some snow off the roof and Miriam basically goes, Hey, Mike, grab this and throws a violin up to me. And I started playing it. And of course, I wasn't even know what she was doing. I'm going, what are you doing? And I said, play the violin. Let me take a picture. So I'm like, OK. So, you know, fill around the roof. And I it's mean, the post that just I mean, keeps giving. I, I mean, mean right. this is once a year and everybody thinks it's so cute and it's just so funny. <laughs> so. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Now, the other thing that you guys have been able to, to do is you've done group lessons, virtual group lessons. Uh, and th this is something that I really want to get our company into we're not really doing group lessons at all right now and i think just the economics of it makes so much sense and the social aspects of it for group lessons so many benefits to that as well um and I, I, you know, I had been thinking like, man, once all this is over, I want to start group lessons. But then when I was on your website last night, I, re I saw you guys are actually doing virtual group lessons. And so tell me, how does that work? How are you setting that up? What's the tips and tricks to make a successful group lesson and, and specifically a successful virtual group lesson? So we have a few different... Um... So actually, we just completed a series of lessons through the local school district in our in our town. I mean, we, we have um, and we're actually going to be working with another school district on the same thing. But the one that was in our town actually is part of their Saturday Academy. So um, those classes, uh, we volunteered actually for those particular classes. The others, you know, are obviously part of our curriculum. But they, they had a whole lot of different people in the community donate their services for these Saturday Academy classes. So we did a guitar class and a uh, sing like a rock star class. So basically, these were beginner kids who had never played before. Uh, we set up the Zoom link, they log in um, with voice. I was able to sort of, uh, we worked on learning one song that we would, I would teach them little parts of the song. I would teach them some exercises and some good vocal technique. And each week they would come back and sing the part of the song that they did. So they would each kind of get the chance to sing by themselves. And then we are in the process of making a video of their work, which is which is really cool. I loosely based that on my experience with our kids taking swim lessons when they were younger. So, you know, you'd have like six kids sitting on the edge of the pool. The, the swim instructor would come and take each kid individually to go out and swim um, and teach them a, one of the strokes that they were supposed to be doing. And in the meantime, mm -hmm. one of the other kids was working on that skill. And it was a really nice way to be able to uh, to teach multiple kids. And watching, the other kids and are watching. When the other kids are watching, right, and giving individual attention to each kid. And it really works. It's just a great, great thing. And the kids actually, it's so funny, they become friends. They connect with each other. We sometimes let them chat for a minute at the end of class so they can keep making that connection. And he was teaching yeah. the, the guitar class and we 
posted a bunch of pictures of that. It's really, really cute class. And it's yeah. nice to, be able to make a video as the final project for them. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So uh, are you using anything like are you uh, is everyone's mic on the whole time and it's just like that or, or is they muted and you're and yeah. they're playing along to you kind of how are you handling that? Um, we use mute a lot. You know, we ask everybody to keep their mic muted when we're speaking to them or when they're trying something. Um, but, you know, it's nice to actually have them unmuted, too. They can't sing together, but they can listen to each other and cheer each other on and kind of give each other that boost when they've sang something. Yeah. You know, I think you have to keep things on the shorter side. So, for example, I don't have them each singing through a whole song. I think that's a lot to make the other kids wait and watch. So we'll do, you know, a chorus or something like that so they can all kind of listen and, that, and they make sure they all have the opportunity to do something in the class. I think it's up to the instructor, too, to decide how they're doing that mm -hmm. you know that's what part of being a good instructor now via something like zoom you know there's different mm -hmm. there's different qualifications now needed because you know but it's similar again to doing it in person you know if you're going to run a classroom of eight people you have to ask some people okay stop playing for a second let's work on this part you know so you kind and of, you're in a group lesson i mean you know that's going to be yeah, the setup you're kind of doing the same thing you know virtually yeah are you grouping these by skill level and age level, primarily skill level, primarily age level, um, or I'm assuming you're doing like a beginning guitar class and it's for this age range of student, right? So tell me, the, tell me some of the logistics behind how you're setting up the logic of it. Well, the classes we did for our local school district was set up by grade. So sure. they had like, I think it was a third and fourth graders were in one. So that was definitely set up by grade and by level. It was it was geared towards beginners. Um, we have a whole series of classes starting with another school district that was looking for an after school music program. So we're going to be supplying those classes to them through through their school, and they are setting that up by grade and by level. So we will have you know a group of beginners that have never played the cello before. You know, gotcha. and there's a group of like maybe sixth graders who've been playing the violin for two years. So it's easy to do it that way because we have the school sort of helping to facilitate that. But when we set up groups here, we usually try to do it by age range. So we might do fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. Or like with my musical theater, I have a big age, age range for that. Um, you know, I'll do up to age 14. And somehow they all work together well. You know, the older kids can kind of show the younger kids how, how to do certain things with, and inspire with, them. With the guitar, technically, uh, so what happens with that sometimes is you might have you might have a student that plays already that, you know, is, is in that same age bracket, but already knows like all their open string chords at the beginning of the neck. And then some of the new kids are they're just starting their open string chords. Like even the, like I wrote, I wrote a bunch of different guitar instructional manuals and the um, the beginning chords, you know, like an E minor would just be like the first three strings open. So if there's mm -hmm. a kid who's there and the other kid already knows a bigger E minor, maybe now I have him working on bar chords. So we're playing the same chord progression all together, but the student that already plays is doing more advanced versions of the chords and the kids that just started are doing the easy versions. Gotcha. So that's a way that we can have them play together. And are you all offering group lessons for older students as well? like, you know, adults and so on and so forth? Yeah, well, right now we're, like we were saying before, we're relaunching our rock bands for adults. So that's sort of what's going to be the the uh, the group class for them. Um, but usually when we do a group class, like we'll do like, like it's usually beginners that want to do it. Like, like more advanced students usually want to stick to the private lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's sort of like- We get a lot of calls also from people that, people will call to find out about say guitar lessons. And then I'll find out that they just did a group guitar lesson and they kind of got a little bit out of it, you know, and they want to, they want to now do a private lesson. So I think you're right. Like yeah. A lot of people that have the, the group lesson experience, I think can be more of like an introduction. And then I think yeah. each person will kind of, each person branches off, you know, it's you a can, nice way to get people started, though. Like, and in the summer when the weather was warm, we did a free group piano lesson outside, and we had a huge amount of people show yeah. up, and um, we had a bunch of people interested in lessons from that who signed up for a little group, and then from there went to private lessons. So it's sort of like a process, I think. I think it's the beginning of the process. Yeah, yeah, I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Um, and then, so you say you're getting ready to relaunch these uh, rock band 
uh, groups. Is, are these gonna be in-person or virtual? Yeah, so we're going for, for in-person. Um, we're gonna start with one. Uh, the interesting thing is all the people that just signed up for the, the rock band, are, they're all doctors and they've all been vaccinated. <laughs> <laughs> nice, so nice. They're all like 100% in. But we have a big space. We're, we're going to separate them. Masks. Everyone's going to be masked. We have the plastic barriers. We have the new MERV 13 filters on the building. And we're going to really try to kind of come up with creative ways to manage the singing part of it. I think that yeah. would be the biggest challenge. We're not going to do a show though. We're either going to live stream something that we record. We're going to stream something that we record through Zoom or if the weather gets warmer, we can try to do something outside. Right. But pre, we're not quite yeah. there yet here. Pre, Pre-pandemic, we the you know the adult rock bands, we would have like eight of them a week, like eight different bands. A lot of music going on here and you know the bands would rehearse. Then we have an area where they can showcase and we have a cafe. And so we'd have this like, you know, big event with eight bands. We, we were playing. supposed to have one two days before we shut down. Yeah. And we canceled it because, you know, yeah, we, COVID, eight, eight we were bands like, were supposed to play. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're anyway, we're starting that up again now. I love it. And then uh, did I see that you guys have done a virtual open mic as well? Yeah. Yeah. So during our lockdown, we did it once a week. We did it on Thursday nights and it was so nice that it wasn't just about the music. It was really about meeting with people and connecting and talking like they would play a song and then we'd have like a discussion about it. And it was getting a lot of people were, were joining us and it was really fun. It was actually something we were really looking forward to every Thursday night because it was just nice to see people and connect with people. And we're so used to people coming through here and being around people all the time that you know, this was particularly hard for us as just liking to be around people. So that kind of helped fill that void. Well, it's just strange when, you know, there's days that we're really busy. There's a lot of teachers working, everything's virtual, online sales are going, like it's all busy through the computer screen. But we don't see Which anybody. is bizarre, you know, but there's nobody in the building. So like, you turn, yeah. you turn the computer screen off, it's just silent. Yeah. So it's like, it's just a really strange thing. But the, the, the open mics that we did for adults specifically, and then the recitals that we did virtually were so much fun because we have a tremendous, you know, a big mailing list. And so a lot of the open mic people that were coming here, you know, are people we've known for a long time who have moved away. They're all over the country, so they could never participate in, you know, in our current open mics because they don't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. So now what happened is they're all back. So adults that come here, you know, that still live in the area that knew the people that moved 10 years ago. All of a sudden, we're all seeing each other on the screen, and they're like, "Oh my God, what's up? Where'd you?" It's and so like, great. Oh, I live in Florida now, you know. But they're they're, yeah. they're back to doing our open mic, so it's so much fun, and we were we were really having a good time because a lot of these people we've literally we've known some of these people for twenty years. You know, we've known some of the people that do our open mics are guys that took lessons with me. You know, in my mother's basement when I was living with my parents when I was right eighteen, I was teaching. You know, and I was teaching these guys then. You know, so it, it's really, it's incredible. And when we, I think in the, at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, people were like feeling emotional about a lot of different things. And we would, you know, people were telling stories and we were sort of eating dinner together. You know, we we're like eating and going like, what are you eating? You know, and <laughs> talking about food and people, I'm not having this wine with this thing. And let me play you a song now, you know, and I remember taking lessons with you. Like, it was really fun. Yeah, that's awesome. But yeah, well, but this currently, has been... we, yeah, currently we're doing, you know, open mics and, virtual recitals and all that stuff. I love it. This has been such a great conversation and I, and I hope that anyone listening uh, is inspired and has picked up a few things of, if they're doing virtual lessons of ways they can do it better. Uh, and if they're not that they, rec you know, pull their head out and realize, Oh wait, this isn't, this isn't going to end. This is only going to get bigger from here yeah. uh, in terms of virtualization and uh, get involved in their community, find a way to be a part of it. Just a lot of really fun stuff. So last question that I always ask, if you could send a message to yourself 10 years ago, what would you tell the younger you? And this goes for both of you. Wow. I can think about that for a second. What would we tell you? I would say um, be prepared for anything and always diversify. <laughs> that would be my advice. Because, you know, I think this type of career and when you're an entrepreneur, you never know which way the your path's going to go. So you just have to be ready and you have to sort of, see into the future a little bit. 
Yeah. It's not always that you're like prepared for anything as much as like you're ready, right. you're, ready. you're ready for anything. And when uh, you see something, Hey, the, the ground has shifted below my feet. It's time to move. Uh, you move. Or if right. anyone who's, who's read the, the book, uh, you know, who moved my cheese, which is a very popular business book. That's very simple, but you know, if your cheese gets moved, then go find it, you know, go right. find the next piece of cheese. Don't just sit there, keep coming back to the same area, wondering where it's at. So uh, uh, yeah, be, being prepared and, and ready to adapt to whatever the landscape is, is super right. important. Mike, how about you? 10 years ago, what would you tell yourself? You know, I think, I think uh, the first thing that comes to mind is just to um, probably manage my time a little bit better and not, um, I, you know, I've had a lot of great experiences. We've done a lot of cool things, but, you know, we've done a lot of gigs where maybe I stayed out later than I needed to and spent, you know what I mean? Like I just, right now, like I love to exercise and I love to try to get up early and take care of myself in such a way where I'm just, I think I'm more focused now and I could feel it, you know, if I'm, if I'm healthy, um, I feel like I'm a lot more kind of laser sharp and ready to go. Um, and I, you know, I wake up more inspired and able to do more things. And I, I think 10 years ago, you know, I, I think I was working myself so hard, but I was also playing so hard in certain ways that, you know, it's, I think I, I could have maybe been more focused back then and even be further ahead now than we are. Yeah. Okay. Then what do you want to tell yourself 10 years in the future? 10 years in the future. Um, wow. I don't know. You go first. Um, I think I, I'm, I, I'm a big fan of uh, reaching out and learning from people and, and maybe, you know, not trying to do everything myself. It's okay to not do everything yourself and to, you know, hire people and ask questions. You know, I think sometimes you can get the job done quicker by sort of outsourcing certain things. Yeah. Uh, Bob, Bob Nagan always says, some, you know, so many times, especially if you want to get on a fast track, think who, not how. And uh, ha thinking how to do something, I mean, there could be benefits to that, but that's the long road, you know, that, and there's times where it's better just to fast forward. It's better just to, hey, how can I do this quick? If you want to yeah. do it quick and do it well, who? Who yeah. do I know that, that, can, that can come do this for me? Who do I know that can give me advice? Uh, who do I know has done this before? Like, uh, who, not how. That's, that's such a, right. a huge key. Right. And I think a, a part of that, though, is to make sure that you know how to do most things in your business. You know, I, I know that if anybody isn't here, I, I can do all the jobs that need to be done here. But, you know, there's, there's a lot of bigger things where it's just it's too time consuming. You know, you can only do yep. so much, you know. You know, I, I, and, and your business will grow or, or can grow uh, to the point where that mindset is actually very limiting. I, I, I disagree with what you just said, but I only because at a point it becomes less effective when you're small and you've got a, a smaller business, smaller, smaller number of staff members. Uh, it, that that mindset totally makes sense. But if you grow it to the point like I've got 100 employees, like. I have people that specialize in things that I will never understand, much right. like I'm not going to try to understand uh, accounting. I have an accountant for that. Uh, I'm, you know, I have a strong understanding of uh, finance and things like that. But I also have a VP of finance now that ha knows way more about this than I've ever known. It's fine that she has the expertise in it. I don't have to know everything about it. And so I've, I've finally just kind of embraced that where there's all kinds of things in our business, even in the daily operation of our business, that I don't know how to do. Now, I do know how to run the register. Uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 don't run, today. I don't know how to run auto pays. I don't know how to run the lesson schedules. There's all kinds of stuff I don't know, but I, you know, there's someone that does. And that, that's to me, I'd, I'd rather spend my time not learning someone else's job that they already have that job. I want to spend my time thinking about the direction of our company where we need to be going, where we need to, what we need to stop doing, what we need to start doing. How do I lead, inspire, motivate? That's more relevant to me than knowing how to, you know, run the auto pace system. Right. So well, maybe, well, it's maybe... funny because somebody once said to us years ago, like they said, it's time to stop working in your business and work on your business. Right. And yes. I think that going through this whole pandemic, we sort of took a step back because we had to restructure so much. But I think like the, the goal is to get back to that, you know, yeah. again. And, and I, I agree with you too. And I think that it's a matter of finding 
the things, you know, like, you know, we, we have, you know, like an accountant and a bookkeeper and I don't do any of that kind of stuff, but, mm-hmm. so, and I wouldn't, that's, it's all of that. I think it's, it's knowing the amount that you need to know, you know, like for instance, I had guys that were here doing all the shipping and I wasn't even, didn't even know how to put the FedEx label together. You know, and then if one of those guys isn't there on a day, you know, something like that. Like, I need to make sure mm-hmm. I know those simple tasks of the day, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It can be a trap, I guess, is just my point. So just yeah, be. Yeah, I, 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 and I agree with you. I feel like I deal with this so many times. I've got two relatively new store managers right now for two of my locations. And um, uh, they are falling into that classic trap of like, well, before I ask someone else to do this, I need to understand it. Like, no, no, you don't. You right. really don't. Like, just show that you trust your people and have them go figure it out and do it. Right. Like, because you waiting till you understand it so you can teach it to them is a, is a bottleneck. You are creating a bottleneck in this business. And I'm impatient. Like, I'm ready to go. You know, and you've got a lot of people here. So get each one of those things, what people working on something and let's move. You know, right. if I've got to wait till you understand everything and you train everyone, then it's going to take forever to make the kind of a, a achievement that I want to make. Miriam, yeah. what about you? What's the lesson for 10 years from now? What's the what's the, the thing you want to tell yourself? I think that as as entrepreneurs and business owners, we work very, very hard and we don't always take a break. And I think like take a step back, take a break. You know, we have a, a a kid who's going to be going off to college next year. And I, we've actually been sort of restructuring our schedule so that we can be available to maybe visit him if he wants us to when he goes away to college. So I think that's something that I've, I've really thought a lot about um, and really take stock of, of what you have. You know, I think like, again, like this pandemic's taught us a lot of things and it's taught us to appreciate things that we probably didn't realize that we should appreciate so much. So I would tell myself, definitely do that. <laughs> I love it. You guys, this is so much fun. You did such a great job and, and it's so nice to get, you know, I've heard you speak several times at NAM, but it's always in these short 15, 20, 25 minute things. And you can kind of get some stuff out there, but it's hard to get a whole picture and stuff. So it's really neat today to get to a deep dive in it. And I know for myself personally, uh, you've definitely have got me re- rethinking. I said something last year and one of our, we do these quarterly management meetings where we, well, we generally try to bring everyone together. Sometimes we have to make them virtual, but our, all of our leadership team comes together. And I had said something to them last year about like, you know, uh, we've done what we can with the lesson program in terms of like, you know, we've, we're, all, we're doing some virtual lessons, but rather than trying to build it or grow it right now, which I felt like it's just an uphill battle, like we're just going to stop fighting that uh, and start focusing on something else. And I'd even I I want to hire a new education coordinator because I've got a admit let us a lesson coordinator who's more of like an administrative type of person. They're, she's great with the scheduling and the billing and stuff like that, but she's not a musician. She can't come up with any of the content or any of that kind of stuff. And so I've been wanting to hire that person. And I keep telling myself, like, I'm gonna do that probably towards the end of the pandemic and do it. But after talking with you all, after watching your session again uh, from the Believe in Music, after watching Pete's session, I really have realized, God, I, that was a big mistake. Like, uh, I rather than just thinking this can't be done, I should have really just got into this. Well, it's going to be virtual. Like, let's make an, an amazing virtual experience because there's so many people with kids sitting at home that they're going to want them to do something productive with this time. Or even adults sitting at home that are going to, you know, they want to do something productive with this time. Really kind of missed the mark on that. So I can't go back in time and make not, it better. It's not too late, though. I think yeah, you exactly. Think people have all tried it out now, so they know what it is. So it's a much easier sell. And I've yeah. even been talking to our local school district. Like, like you know, I think they're just kind of they can't wait to go back to regular school. But I feel like you take this time right now and create something amazing. And who knows, in the end, you have both, or you have a lot more options. So I think it's I, I totally everybody, agree. not just music. Yeah. Yeah, it's not too late, just like it's not too late to start an e-commerce site. You know, I mean, you didn't, it, it would have been great if you would have started your e-commerce site in the late 90s. Like, boy, what a good time that would have been to start right. start building your brand. But you didn't do that. So you started now. Like if you have you know, whatever it is, you just you, you have no choice. You can't yes. go back. You know, you have yeah. no choice. except. Well, you do have a choice. Back. Yeah, you, you can ignore it. Uh, but yeah. I think if you yeah. ignore it, you ignore it at your peril and uh, you're likely going to find that to be uh, it could be it's going to be detrimental to your business and and uh, 
possibly could even cause the demise of your business. So you've got to adapt and thrive. You got to go find where the cheese has moved or you're going to struggle. Right. Right. 